Hi, I'm Brian for your tutoring high school biology. Today's topic, speciation and population genetics. There are a lot of organisms on the earth, and one of the questions we have is, how'd they get there? Well, one method is speciation, the making of new species. Well, okay, first off, what's a species? A species is a group of organisms that will mate freely in the wild and have fertile offspring. That is to say, their offspring can have kids and they won't die. Okay, there are three steps to speciation. First off, geographic isolation. Let's say there's a population of, oh, say anything. How about coconuts? And suddenly, there is, bam, a canyon, so they can't mate. Or, bam, a river, so they can't mate. Or, bam, a swallow carries half of the population over to England, and so they can't mate. Okay, now they're geographically isolated from each other. That means there are now two gene pools. This one has a gene pool, and this one has a gene pool, and they're completely separate. That means that the two can start changing separately of each other and produce eventually completely different species. That's step two, genetic divergence. On the microscopic level, this occurs through random mutation in genes. Addition, deletion, inversion, and duplication, and translocation. It's okay, I'll explain all of this. Addition is the adding of bases. Deletion is the removal of bases. These are known as frame shift mutations. They shift the reading frame when your mRNA heads into the ribosome and starts making proteins. Let me demonstrate. Here we have a short sequence of bases, let's say mRNA. Let me perform an addition mutation by adding an extra A. These lines mark the reading frame, but now that I've added an extra A, I'll have to shift it. And now we're producing completely different proteins because our amino acids have all changed. Likewise, if I deleted one of the bases, a deletion, we'd have to shift the reading frame in the other direction. This changes every single amino acid following that particular frame shift mutation. Usually, these are fatal. The other types, I'm going to zoom out and, if you will, take a look at long genetic sequences. Let's say we have a genetic sequence represented by the letter A. Lots of A's, T's, C's, G's, whatever. Another one B, another one C. In an inversion, a number of sequences will be, if you will, reversed. Instead of A, B, C, maybe C, B, A. The next one is duplication. That's when one of these sequences gets copied. Instead of ABC, perhaps AABC. We have a segment copy. And last up, translocation. For this one, we're going to need multiple chromosomes. So we have our ABC chain, and let's have another chromosome, maybe DEF. In a translocation, part of one chromosome will fall off and attach to another. Let's say the B and C fall off and attach over here. One chromosome ends at sequence A, another one goes D, E, F, B, C. Translocation. Now, of course, any mutation is subject to the powers of natural selection. If it's a good mutation, chances are that particular organism will survive and reproduce. If it's a bad one, decreasing chance of survival, it probably won't get passed on because the organism dies. The force of natural selection can be grouped up into three simple things, niches, predators, and genetic drift. A niche is, if you will, an organism's role in its environment. In effect, what it eats and what eats it, to some extent. It's mostly what it eats. Like, let's say we have a bunch of, oh, I know, Darwin's finches. There are big nuts, there are medium nuts, and there are little nuts. Some birds will eat the big nuts, some will eat the medium nuts, and some will eat the little nuts. Each one of those is its niche. Big nuts are the big birds, medium nuts for the medium birds, and little nuts for the little birds. This will usually govern which mutation goes and succeeds. Like if you had a mutation that for some reason made it impossible for you to eat big nuts even though you're a big bird, then you'd probably die because you couldn't eat those nuts and you couldn't fit in a niche anymore. Alright, next up, predators. What eats you? Again, you just have to be faster than the slower animal in the pack. So basically, you'll have to be able to escape your predators. Mutations that aid you in escaping your predators are usually passed on. The ones that don't usually leave you dead. Friendly genetic drift. This is just random mutation. Like, let's say we have a population of ladybugs. Some are spotted, some are not. Genetic drift means that one trait might get selected before, even if it has no evolutionary advantage. For some reason, a bunch of them end up spotted after 20 years. This doesn't help them, this doesn't hurt them. That's genetic drift. Now, we have graphs that describe how genes change over time. The first step is stabilizing selection. Like, let's actually label these graphs. Towards the left side, we'll have one extreme. How about small beaks? Let's represent finches. 
and towards the right side we'll have the other extreme, large peaks. Naturally, in the middle we have medium-sized peaks. Stabilizing selection means that a lot of the organisms that survive and pass on their traits have sort of the middling trait. Then there's directional selection. Directional selection suggests that a lot of the organisms that survive have either one extreme or the other, but not both. See, in here, birds with small beaks are mostly dead. Birds with middle-sized beaks, I kind of make in it, but not as much as the birds with really big beaks. Directional selection. Of course, this could be directed the other way, and you could have a lot of small beak birds, very few me middle birds, and very, very few big birds. Finally, there's disruptive selection. This is towards both extremes and away from the middle. In this particular case, the medium birds are mostly dead, but there are a lot of big beak birds and a lot of little beak birds. Disruptive selection, away from the center in both directions. Okay, and that's genetic divergence. Finally, reproductive isolation. The species can no longer mate, can no longer produce viable, fertile offspring. Let's take a look at that. All right. Before even the egg is fertilized, there are five isolating mechanisms. First up is by habitat. If one animal lives here and the other one lives here and they never go see each other, then they can't reproduce because they never see each other. Simple enough. Different habitats cannot reproduce. By behavior. This usually refers to a courtship ritual. Let's say you're a bird and you have to stomp your foot five times and flap twice if you want to get a mate. But the bird you're trying to court requires a different courtship dance. You do your courtship dance, the bird completely ignores you. That's behavioral isolation. Okay, next up by time, temporal isolation. If you're a badger that mates during the spring, you're not going to be able to mate with a badger that mates only during the winter. You may love her as much as you like, she's not interested. Temporal isolation. Mechanical isolation. Okay, this one's pretty simple. It doesn't fit. The male reproductive organs do not fit into the female reproductive organs. No chance of getting sperm anywhere near that egg. Last up, gametic isolation. This happens when the chemical receptors on the egg do not match the ones on the sperm and the sperm does not penetrate. Gametic isolation. No fertilization happens. But even after you get offspring, there are some factors that will prevent that offspring from having still more offspring. First up, if it's viable. Some offspring of two different species will just die. It'll either come out dead, or it'll slowly break down over the course of its life. Next up, if it's fertile. Pretty much most offspring produced by two different species are not fertile. Take, for instance, the mule. If a horse and a donkey mate, they produce a mule, but the mule is completely infertile. It cannot have offspring at all. Finally, this idea of breakdown. Sometimes two species will mate and produce an offspring that does survive and can have other offspring. The thing is, over time, generations of this new interspecies production will become weaker and weaker and degenerate until finally you end up with infertile, dying creatures. That is reproductive isolation even following fertilization. And these are what keeps each species separate. Okay, now you may go, well, okay, that would take several years. Do we, always, do we have evidence for this? Well, yes, we have evidence for speciation and also, to some extent, evolution. First up, vestigial structures. Did you know that pigs have toes? Now, there really is no reason for pigs to have toes. They have hooves. Those work out pretty well. But if you check real closely, they do have a little toe in the back. That was when they actually had toes and perhaps lived in a different environment. Snakes. If you look at a snake skeleton, some of them have hip bones. You might wonder, wait a minute, snakes don't have legs. Why do they need hip bones? They don't. It's simply there. And then, of course, the human appendix. Humans don't need appendices. The appendix used to be part of a larger organ that contained bacteria that would digest cellulose. In other words, we used to eat a lot of plants. We don't anymore, and so our appendix is just a small vestigial structure, if you will. It doesn't really do anything, but it's still there from evolution. That's why we usually get it removed. It doesn't do anything, and bacteria might build up and kill us. Then there are homologous structures. These are structures between different species that are equivalent but perform different actions. And the best example is always with the bones. Here is a rough diagram of a human arm. Humius, radius, ulna, and of course, five fingers. This is a diagram of a whale flipper. A whale flipper has four fingers. You might go, wait, whales don't play computer games. What do they need fingers for? They don't. That's the point. 
it is a homologous structure. They have more or less the same skeletal structure, even if the purpose is completely different. Even batwings. Batwings have five fingers. No, they don't play Game Boys. They use them to fly. But again, homologous equivalent structures perform different functions. Evidence for speciation and evolution. To recap, speciation is the process by which new species are made. Remember, a species is a group of organisms that will mate in the wild and produce viable, fertile offspring. There are three steps to speciation. Geographic isolation, separating a population into two halves, or even more. Genetic divergence, this is the changing of the gene pools of those populations. This can happen through mutations, an addition of bases, deletion of bases, an inversion of sequences of bases, a duplication of a sequence, or even the translocation, moving one series of bases from one chromosome to the end of another. This is governed by natural selection and usually geared towards a niche, if you will, what that animal is going to eat. Away from predators, helping an animal run away from predators, and of course genetic drift, simple randomness favoring one trait over the other. There are three graphs to describe these genetic divergences. Stabilizing selection, where the middle trait is selected. Directional selection, where one extreme is selected. And disruptive selection, where both extremes are selected. Now, the last step is reproductive isolation. This is when species cannot reproduce. There are five things that prevent species from reproducing before the egg is fertilized. Living in different habitats, having different courtship behaviors, mating at different times, mechanical isolation, the uh, reproductive gamete organs do not fit, and finally by gamete, if the sperm cannot enter the egg because of the wrong chemicals. If the offspring is produced, it may not live, it may not be able to have children, or over several generations it may break down. Evidence for this include vestigial structures, structures that no longer serve any function, and homologous structures, equivalent structures between different species that perform different functions usually. Alright, that's all for now. See you on a bright career. See you next